Um, so again, software craftsmanship, something I care a lot about. And um, the um, this talk, just so you, I have a little bit of intro. Um, technically, I come out of a, as the rabbi said this morning, he's on his third career, I'm on a couple of mine. Years ago, I was in uh, computers, I did sales, I worked for IBM at one point, selling, I've sold mainframe, software, mid-range stuff, all that kind of stuff, and eventually went into the software side of it. And uh, I remember being at IBM, <coughs> and a friend of mine who was IT guy came to my desk one day, and he's like, dude, you gotta check this out. He starts banging on my computer, and and I was quite the computer novice back then. I used them, but I, you know, I, that was kind of how, how it went. <clears throat> and he popped this thing up, and on my screen it said usatoday.com. And, and I looked at that, I said, wait a minute. Is this the newspaper I'm going to get at 5 o'clock tonight? And, and he said, no, the one you get at 5 o'clock tonight, uh, that was actually probably on here like 4 o'clock this morning. This one that you're looking at now is the one they get tomorrow. And I was like, oh my God. So, and I'm sitting there looking at this thing, and there's, you know, information and day driven stuff, and there's stock tickers. This is in 1994. And I, I looked at him, and I said, that's the future, that's what I want to do. And I started, you know, reading books and finding things out, and just doing anything I could to learn the web. And like a lot of us, started coding HTML and CSS and led into everything else. and eventually became a full stack developer. So from way back I've just been in love with the web and browser based applications. And I really I really love JavaScript. In the course of all this, um, I have a personal journey. And in coming to understand software regardless of the language and the different things about different environments and just how you have to think to actually create good software and, and develop good software. Uh, I think all of us have been through times where we've had to fix things, and there's, uh, you know, there's, a, there's, there's good code out there, and then there's a lot of not so good code, and you have to fix it. Um, so in that, I'm going to kind of take you through the journey of this, and if you just bear with me a little bit on a few things, I'm kind of laying about laying out some ideas, and we'll go from there. This uh, this talk actually came from my personal journey into software craftsmanship and trying to figure out. You know, how the heck to do this stuff, and, and what is the good stuff, and what is the bad stuff. And, and I go to meetups all over town. I'm here in Atlanta, and we have a lot of meetups here. It's really great. And I always go to the meetup after the meetup, you know what I mean? And there, there's so many conversations you can get into with people with somebody speaking, and they're just delivering their whole speech. But you go to the bar afterwards, and guys have a couple of drinks, and they start talking about their projects, and everybody has their rants about code. And you actually, I find I learn as much, if not more, at the meetup after the meetup. Um, and, and that is the genesis of this talk, is concepts and ideas and transformations that I went through, things that I learned from talking to other people, and, and my journey into software craftsmanship. That's how this talk came out. And um, it's not my ideas. Uh, this is stuff that comes from books and comes from some of you in this room. Some of you I talked to last night at the bar. And uh, as, as we went through all this stuff. So I, I don't take credit for anything I say in here pretty much. It's, it's just the cumulative wisdom in the community of developers that we have here in Atlanta and at conferences I've been to and in books that I've read. Uh, I don't claim that I'm any kind of an expert. I'm definitely not a Kyle Simpson. <laughs> I'm just a guy coding that wants to do a good job and I just love code. I love good code. So in that, in that respect, I will start off by saying they used to think that the earth was flat. A flat earth had limitations. You could only go so far in one direction. There were only so many directions you could go. There were monsters that lived out there, carnivore monsters. They were hungry too. If you fell off the edge, there was even bigger monsters there. And this was a conventional wisdom and most people didn't question it. And they didn't take the risk to actually find out if it was true or not. Many, many, many years went by and sailors and the whole thing of ships sailing over and seeking off and all the stuff. Eventually things led one to another. Someone questioned the status quo and they took a risk. They eventually found out the earth was actually a big round ball. What they feared wasn't true. Many, many years, a lot of things later, they found out it was actually a lot bigger than that. As coders, it's kind of similar to the journey that we live in 
we have a world that we live in that's contained. Ours kind of looks like this. Actually, it looks like this. This is a triangle. At the top, we have scope. This is the stuff that we're coding, the stuff that we're trying to build. The schedule is the time. You have so much time, the project stops. Project starts and the project finishes. There's a time limit on what we do a lot of times. Resources, cost, budget, and people. Uh, not everybody's seen this before. It's amazing. I talk to people and uh, I got a conversation with people at uh, Jock and Jill's last night. They had no idea what this concept was. This is called, oh, before I get ahead of myself. The scope, the schedule, and the resources in the middle is the quality. So the quality obviously gets limited by the limiting factors of scope, quality, and schedule, and resources. This is known in software circles as the Iron Triangle. The Iron Triangle has limitations. You can only go so far in one direction. There's only so many directions you can go. If you go too far in one direction, there are serious consequences. For decades, the development community didn't question the prevailing wisdom or take the, or take the risk to find out if it was true. We had a process we called Software Development Lifecycle, SDLC, most often known as the waterfall method. There was requirements, there was design, implementation, verification, maintenance. You can Google this thing and you can lock a lot of charts and there's so many derivatives of this, but the idea is that each thing is a stage and the water goes down the hill and goes over the step. It doesn't goes downhill, it doesn't go back uphill. So each person is accomplishing something at each one phase and they're trying to get their job done and then the water goes, water falls down the hill. Once it's off your step, it's not your job anymore. So you try to do your job in a way that somebody else can't mess your work up and it's, you're not going to get blamed. Kind of went like this. The business had an idea, they told us what they wanted. And the max we can pay is this. Exec said, you got to deliver this thing by a certain date. What they didn't tell you was that they uh, had to be in there for their bonuses to come. So in this whole process of deciding how we're going to build software and all this complex stuff, they came up with an idea and they called it BDAP. Big design up front. You have different phases and again you'll see different uh, names applied to this, but you have the requirements in the design phase. They document everything, how it's going to be built. After they create the design, they create documents about the design. Sooner or later, somebody gets around to coding. When you're all done coding, you test it. You get some feedback from the customer, and you deliver it to production. In reality, the story went like this. <clears throat> they got some business analysts to do the requirements and design the product. A bunch of BAs building screens, writing documents, what the requirements were. All the conversations at the time and the product were held between the BAs and the business. That took a long time to, doc, to design and document, and they have to get it right so it doesn't come back on them. In the meantime, the customers are having these conversations, and they're getting excited because they can see their product materializing in front of their eyes. After the BAs do the job, their job to uh, spec the project out, it goes for approval. Back and forth for months, the process is now about cost and contract negotiation. Meanwhile, the customer is still waiting for something he asked for many months ago. At this time, it could be a year. When the project finally gets approved, the architects go to work and design the architecture and document this design. So the architects are doing the designing. Since they don't know everything they need to know about the product and its future, they often over-engineer the design. They build stuff that's not necessary now. They over-document these designs. When the software falls short of expectations, it won't be their fault. At some point, the project finally goes to development. At this point, it's been a very long time since the customer asked for the product. By now, more than half the project schedule is used up. The devs start to actually build the software from the documents. They don't really ever talk to the customer because the BAs and the architects did that. The development team is being managed by someone who's actually not even a coder but he's incented to deliver the product on time and on budget. Ultimately, compromises have to be made to, re to meet the, uh, the deadlines, and coders that care about quality are often accused of gold-plating the software. 
There isn't, everybody know what gold plating is? Everybody doesn't know what gold plating is? Okay. Uh, I'm making it too good, okay? Basically, you're overbuilding something in somebody else's opinion, usually someone who doesn't understand why you're wanting to build it well. Um, so coders that care about the quality are often accused of gold plating. I've been accused of this many times. There isn't enough time to code all the features well, so some of them actually end up being delivered, they're gonna be delivered buggy, and that's being planned that way. By this time, the customer's vertical marketplace has changed much of, much of what they asked for, uh, I'm sorry. By this time, the customer's vertical marketplace has changed and much of what they asked for two years ago isn't even relative to them anymore. Their priorities have changed, they have new hot buttons. They start thinking about all the features and now that they've been thinking about it for a year or two, they have different ideas about how these things can be imp implemented and the goalposts start changing. The deadline doesn't move, the resources aren't increased, and the boss says, do more with less. Eventually they run out of time or money and the project gets delivered. At this time it might be over budget, the deadline might have passed, and some of the features are incomplete, the app has bugs, and the customer not very happy. Whose fault do you think that is? The Iron Triangle is about mitigating risk. The whole idea of the Iron Triangle, you know, we contract the scope, we protect the customer, we have amount of time, we protect the executives, and we say what the resources are, so we track the finance guys, so the pocketbook is corrected, and the guys that are left out to hang are often the developers, because everybody else could dot their I's and cross their T's, and when it doesn't work, it's gonna be your fault. So the triangle does this. When the project goes over budget, what do they say? You're too expensive. When the project goes over deadline, you're just too slow. When it lacks functionality, they say you couldn't finish the job. But if it lacks quality, they say you're incompetent. When your software breaks, you lose the confidence of the business and the customer. The triangle provides structure. It's rigid. It's so rigid that we actually build things with it. You see it in a lot of bridges. You can find things with it. GPS. The problem with this is that software is not a defined process. We're creating, we have a defined process and we have something that we can't really define from the beginning. We don't have this crystal ball that people want us to have in big design up front. Software development is an empirical process and I, I would just encourage you to Google these, look them up on Wikipedia, whatever you want, understand the differences. I won't go into it, but basically software is empirical. It's very complicated. There's a lot of questions to be answered along the way and it's impossible for someone to know everything up front a year or two before you ever start developing the software. Either way, no matter what, you still have to respect the fact that there is an iron triangle, there is an amount of time, there are functions, there are features that the customer wants, and there's a certain amount of money that they are able or willing to pay. This went on for quite a while, and eventually someone questioned the status quo. And they took a risk, they had a revolutionary idea. The triangle didn't have to be one big triangle. This started happening in the 90s and eventually resulted in this. The Manifesto for Agile Software Development. A group of guys, notice the authors at the bottom. The guys that signed this document, uh, many of you have read books, but these guys wrote, we are covering better ways of de developing software by doing it and helping others do it. Through this work, we have come to value individuals and interactions over processes and tools. Working software over comprehensive documentation. You see how divergent this is from the waterfall method. Customer collaboration over contract negotiation. Responding to change over following a plan. That is, while there's value on the items on the right, we value the items on the left even more. Sandra Mancuso wrote in the book Software uh, Craftsmanship, Professional and Pragmatism and Pride. He wrote, the waterfall approach combined with traditional management style cannot cope with the fast pace of the market anymore. The lean startup model, get it out there quickly, get feedback, iterate, completely changed the game. Over the last several years uh, since Agile has come into play, uh, was created, is becoming popular, it's a revolution in, a lot of, in uh, corporate America. Most of your small startups are using it. 
And in, in large corporations, they're, they're realizing that, that agility matters and they're doing things to become more agile. This is having a, a lot of companies, uh, especially the smaller companies. Large corporations are being flattened. Uh, smaller ones are easier to flatten. This is a game changer for developers. We end up having less managers telling us what to do. We become empowered. We become self-organizing teams. We have less opportunity to be the quiet, stereotype programmer that people always think you're some geeky nerd. And like my daughter said, Dad, I don't want to be a programmer when I grow up. And uh, we have a higher need for collaboration. In today's agile environment, we collaborate a lot. The old thing of um, you know the cube farms, right, and the corporation thing, and everybody's quiet. It's a library. Totally different. Most of these places you work now that are agile, uh, especially coding shops, it's open seating. A lot of times you can see the eyeballs of the person across from you, and you're talking back and forth across the wall all day long. I can say from working, having worked in these, that absolutely, I, I remember the first time I walked into one of those environments, um, and I, I'd been used to the cube farm. I'd actually, I'd run my own company for 12 years, so I'd worked out of my house most of the time then. And then I started contracting for a while, did the corporate thing, and then I took this job, um, and it was uh, a very, very, very agile company. They had an open seating floor plan. We had a room that was a couple times the size of this room, but it was L-shaped. And I went in, and there was all these little pods of like these kind of table things with short dividers like this, and be like six people sitting around. And I walked in, and I thought, oh my god, you know, what, what, what have I got myself into? It was kind of scary to start with because I wasn't used to it. I was used to the quiet cube farm. But what I found was, is on that job, the open seating, being able to talk to people back and forth, I've got my head totally in my code. And I can ask somebody something across the wall, they can answer me a question, I had the answer like that. I became, as a developer, I became so much more effective, I learned so much more. I heard conversations going on around me all the time about things I was learning so much by being in this kind of much more agile environment. High degree of collaboration, not only between my team, but uh, with the, uh, the product owners and uh, different people at, at, at all parts of the process. Along with Agile, there's more of a need for people skills and extrovert personalities, like I said, the quiet guy that a lot of us like to be. And, you know, as coders, we're not known for our people skills a lot of times. And that's changing with Agile because we have to be collaborative and we have to develop leadership skills and we have to negotiate. Because we're dealing constantly with, you know, uh, we're, we're dealing with embracing the change in the product. There, a lot of times you have to, you do have to negotiate. Uh, just to tell a quick story, I, I remember... Um, the, uh, I remember going into our product owner's office. We had the three guys on the product team, and they sat. They had kind of commandeered this uh, huddle room that there was a table in, and, and that became the war room for our team where products sat. Because they had phone calls all the time, you know, on speaker and stuff, and we would meet with them in there. But I used to go in and talk to them, and, and uh, I, I was the UI lead, so I was being tasked with fixing things that nobody could else, nobody else was able to fix and cans that had been kicked down the road and things that were built prior to my coming there that you know they're trying to go live and this bug's been in the system for the last year and a half kind of thing. Um, you know, difficult issues like this and, and so I would go in and talk to him and, he, and when we would talk about these things I'd say and explain it to me. I could sit down with the product owners and have a conversation. You know they would talk to the customer a lot of times they would call the customer on the phone and I would sit there and they would have a conversation. Sometimes I would gauge in it, sometimes I wouldn't. We had this very collaborative thing going on. What actually, actually, the whole deal with Agile and most of the Agile frameworks and the product owner, you're actually learning, you know, you learn to value what the customer values. And in order to build some good software, I think that you have to do that. I remember, you know, I talk about negotiation skills. So a lot of times we'd have a story and it would have certain things and they would have a idea of what this meant. And, and I would go in and I'd say, okay, you know, whichever, Kevin or Sid or whatever the guys, you know, which product manager you're dealing with, this story wants this and we have to deliver this in this sprint, but the way you're asking it, it's going to work like this. But what you don't understand is, is that this one point here, we got the 80-20 thing going on. So I have five things under acceptance criteria. And I can get the first four done in one or two days. The last bullet point there is going to take me all the rest of the sprint, and I can't guarantee you I'm going to get it done. So I was constantly negotiating with these guys like this. So we would actually take things like that, and then we would take the one point that was causing the, you know, putting that particular story at risk, and we would drop it down, and we'd create a category we called exclusion criteria, so that QA knew that this functionality had been excluded because it was already written into their test. 
into the QA's test plan for what was going to be delivered this sprint. We drop it into exclusions, and then we create another another JIRA ticket for it, and from that exclusion, we would reference the other tickets. So it was essentially out of the scope for this sprint. I remember this was going on one day, and I was talking to the senior product manager, and we are having a difficult conversation about something that they wanted, and they absolutely believed that the customer wanted it. I'm like, look, Kevin, what you don't understand is, is that you're asking for it to work this way, but this is what I code, this is what I do, this is what I've been doing for a long, long time, and I'm telling you that if you go this direction, you're not going to like the results. And he's like, why? And I go, let me whiteboard this out. So we had whiteboard everywhere. All the walls are whiteboard and glass across the front. And I picked up markers, and I started going around the room with stuff. And he goes, oh, now I understand. And I go, so he goes, well, what can we do about this? He says, I have to deliver this. I've already promised this. I go, I understand that. I said, what we need to do is say, we're going to give you this. We're going to give you the MVP of what you want the minimum viable product. But then we're going to take some of the stuff that you want, some of the fluff, you know, that you want, and we're going to, we're going to get to it maybe next sprint or something like that when we can, you know, apply a little more effort to it. We just don't have space for it right now, but we're going to give you what you want now, give you that product that you can actually start working with and using. And I remember him throwing up his hands and he goes, this is what Agile is all about. And he got so excited because we were negotiating how we are going to attack the story. And I was actually working with him to help him satisfy the needs of his customer. Okay, leadership and negotiation skills. So Agile causes you to actually have to learn all this stuff. In Agile, there's more expectation on you as a coder. Uh, as I said, you have to understand your customer better. You have to be a team player. You have to work harder, but at a sustainable pace. The statistics are showing that Agile teams are, are highly, highly effective, and they're turning out a lot more work than the typical, the, you know, the waterfall method teams. A lot of times on Agile teams, they, they believe in cross-functional teams and the polyglot approach uh, as opposed to, say, a specialized approach. This is actually a really good opportunity for, for us as developers. We have to be accountable for our work. We have to sign off on things. So the first way you sign is obviously on your git commit, right? One of the things that goes on in Agile is mentoring. And uh, this particular job I had, I found myself around some really, really smart people. I love the fact that in Agile, it's not about you know who's senior and who's junior and who's mid or whatever. It's about the team. And the team has goals. And, and if the team wins, the team wins. If the team has a failure, then the team has a failure. But in that, you're always finding that uh, it doesn't matter what it is. Somebody's better at something you do, but there's always an opportunity for you to learn and grow. And in these environments, there was a lot of mentoring that I grew so much in that job, I just loved it. Um, the expectation here also is to deliver working software faster and more often because we, we iterate. In this, you actually, the bar gets raised. And you know, one of, the, one of the criticisms of Agile is that it requires a higher level of expertise. The, the truth of the fact is, 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 yeah, it does. But it actually creates that expertise on the team. The opportunity for you in these environments is, hey, you get to use your brain. You don't have to rely on some document that somebody else wrote up six months or a year ago, and you're just coding and implementing their plan. I remember interviewing for a position once, uh, and I was on the phone interview, and uh, I was asking the guy questions about how it went, and, and I remember him answering me saying, oh, we know exactly what we want. We have the whole thing planned out. We have it all documented. We just need you to come in and code it. I didn't take that job. You have the opportunity to use your brain. That's how you're going to grow is using your brain. You have the opportunity to do the right thing for the customer and the right thing for the software. To work as a team, not only to be mentored, but to, to mentor others in tech skills. And a lot of times in Agile, because they have high expectations, you actually get paid pretty well in some of these environments. Taking this just one more step, Agile is not something you do. A lot of times when you get in conversation with people, they say, well, do you do Agile? Oh, yeah, we do Agile. Well, how do you do it? Oh, we do it like this. When people say that, they really don't understand Agile because um, Agile is not something you do. It's something you are. Agile is a culture that you create that allows other things to happen. It's an important distinction to make. It's something that you are. And a lot of these failed, um, I would say failed, or we should say less efficient Agile transitions have been because they partially implemented things in Agile. That's like you, let's just take your app and throw it out there, but we'll leave a third of it on the shelf. Is it going to work? Probably not. Agile methodologies, on the other hand, Scrum, XP, Kanban, all this kind of stuff, the other terms that you hear, these are all frameworks that tell us how to do things. 
that's the actual stuff that you do. Some of you are starting to wonder at this point, I thought this was a talk about JavaScript craftsmanship. And some of you are saying, I totally get why he's saying this. So here we go. Do you really think that you can create quality software when you are detached from collaborating with the customer? When you don't understand the customer and you're just executing a document that someone else wrote? Does that get you in touch with the customer's needs? Does that ring your bells and make you really want to create something cool? Do you think you create quality software when someone else designed the whole thing and you don't get to use your brain, you're just executing? When the architects who did the design architect the whole system aren't even part of your team. So now you've got a document and you're going, why does he want it this way? He never asked you. You're the guy that has to code it. Do you think you're going to create quality software when you can only get feedback at the end of the project? What happens if you zig instead of zagging in the second month of the project? And that affects everything for the next year? How do you think your product is going to impact the customer? Kind of like if you're on a boat and you get out your compass and you miss your path by one degree and you travel across the ocean. You end up in Africa instead of London, you know. One degree off at the beginning of a project turns into a long way off by the end of the project. Getting constant feedback is really important. You always want to find out if you're on track and if you're meeting the needs. Do you believe you're going to create quality software when any change you ask for because the document that specifies how you're going to do your work, what you're going to create, what it's going to look like, how every little piece of it's going to work. Ultimately, when you get that document and you've all been here, frame of reference, I'm assuming, how many of you guys have been in SDLC environments? Old school waterfall. So you know what I'm talking about. How many have never done waterfall? That's, that's awesome. Um, that really is. You'll never know the pain that has taken to get you here. You, you have no idea. So uh, actually, I, I, I'd rather, I, I say rather, um, I would guess that no matter how good of an agile implementation you have, what framework you're using, Scrum, XP, whatever, there's probably a lot of stuff. It's just it's a really hard transition for a company to make on the culture side of things. It's really easy to do the process, and companies will adopt Agile because they believe in process. They understand that process gets things done, process mitigates risk, and process can guarantee outcomes. So a lot of times when they're buying into Agile, they're buying into the process because they think it's a guarantor and a risk mitigator, but they're not really buying into the whole cultural change that has to go with it. This is why when the crafters of the Agile Manifesto, when they came out, they didn't, they created the manifesto, there was no framework there. We believe in this rather than that. We believe in this rather than that. It's all general stuff. They didn't say, have a scrum meeting, have a sprint that's two weeks. They left that up to you. And if you look at the guys that actually created the manifesto and you trace the names, I mean, one guy is actually the guy that created uh, Scrum, another guy is the guy that created XP, another guy is the guy that created uh, Crystal Clear. The whole list is there. All these Agile methodologies, a bunch of them were represented in that group, and they came together and they said, what's the commonalities here? How can we change the culture? How can, what can we do to, to make this work for this people? In the end, what they were really thinking about is this. And when I think about Agile, and I'm a Scrum practitioner, um, I, I really like Agile a lot. I've done my best working for Agile, my best work working for Agile. I had the most fun, I've learned the most, and I've built the best software that I've ever built in my life working in Agile environments. And if I had to boil it down to somebody can understand it, I would say that there's two things that Agile's trying to do. One idea is that customers want good software. And the other idea is, is that we as developers want to make good software. Find me a customer that wants crappy software. Do any of you, you're not here this weekend because you want to build crappy software. It frustrates you when you're forced to do things in cut corners and build things that you know are going to cause problems. This is our passion. This is what we do. We're 
craftsmen at what we do. We geek out on doing something that's cool and something that's great, something that won't break in what, no matter what environment you put it in. The awesomeness that we like, that we have so much fun doing, challenging our own minds. We need an environment and a culture where this can happen. This is the whole idea of the Agile Manifesto, is to create that environment. That's what this is about. And as you look on here, it's about culture of giving you a place where you can do your best work. If you look at the names in the bottom, and again, I said, you know, a lot of these guys, you've read books by them. I know I certainly have. After they did the Agile Manifesto, uh, within a few years later, another manifesto came out. And this is actually, this is actually where they were trying to take you. I don't know. I, I think I've been hacked. No, I'm just kidding. You awake? <laughs> this is on a website, and you can click a button for one language you want to read it in, so I just thought I'd play with you. Okay. Manifesto for software craftsmanship. Again, they're talking about general things that create culture and create how people think. So a lot of times in software, you know, I, I just, uh, especially in software engineering, so the whole... A lot of the ideas in Agile are taking us in different directions of where traditional software engineering took us. And the whole thing, you know, the, the, the software engineering movement that came out of a, a lot of it grew over the last 20, 30 years, especially since uh, object-oriented languages came out, like you had C++ and you had Java and all this stuff. And, and these guys really applied themselves to doing everything they could to just create awesome software. They were really serious about this. And, and those of you that have worked with some of these guys, I've worked with, I'm some of the best programmers I've ever worked with in my life were Java guys. They're just very, very well studied. They, they, I mean, they know what they're talking about. I, I love working with guys that are just, they, you know, they, they, they can get 3,000 lines of code in their head at one time. They know the whole product. They know what's going on. They understand. You talk about one thing, and they can tell you five places it might break. So um, very, very skilled people. But out of that whole process, you have to remember that these environments and, and a lot of the whole uh, object-oriented world, like I said, the C++ that was around even before the Java was, and then the Java, which has kind of been the king of the hill in enterprise envi environments for several years, that existed in the waterfall environment. And the whole software engineering idea, whatever you want to call it, that whole paradigm, you know, they would grade people... Um, have you all ever heard of the thing called a Dreyfus model? Who's ever, who's ever heard of that? Dreyfus model, a few hands go up. So it talks about how, how people learn things. And, and they ascribe to this whole thing. And they, they begin to pigeonhole people. Well, a novice, this is how he thinks. These are the questions that he asks. And this is what he relies on. He relies on rules, you know. Somebody else, you know, you get to the next step and you start thinking like this and you start relying on these things to get your job done. And then you get to the next level and it goes all the way to the top. And, I, you know, I look at this stuff. I've been coding for 20 years. And I look at the Dreyfus model, and I can tell you, after coding 20 years, I do some things like a novice because it's the best way to do them. Some of those rules are good rules, you know? But what happens with that whole model, and, and you know this, your recruiters call you guys all the time, right? This whole thing of uh, you're a junior coder, you're a mid-level guy, you're a senior guy, you're an architect guy. All that stuff comes out of software engineering mindset. In Agile, we flatten the team and everybody's cross-functional and you're actually skilling people up all the time. And, and, you know, I routinely, routinely I remember situations, the senior architect, if I ask him the same question more than once, he would say, you go figure it out. I'm like, I don't know how to do that, dude. That's, that's, not, that's not my thing. It was fine. We have Git. I'm not worried. Break it. Go ahead. Go figure it out. I'm like, you're kidding me. No. No, I'm not. Why are you making me do this? Because you asked me twice. He says, just go see if you can find where it is, and uh, we'll talk in about 15 minutes. Okay, fine. And over the period of months of doing that, I was actually learning skills that I never would have learned otherwise. And I had one of the smartest guys, the senior architect guy, one of the smartest guys I've ever worked with in my life that would he just mess with my head all the time and do this kind of stuff to me. He's always playing with my head. He's always playing with why you asked me that question. And I'd say something. Just 
so stinking smart. Um, I find that challenging, and this is something that I do in my career. Is I'm always trying to put myself around people that are smarter than me. So in this, um, going back to, again, the Agile manifesto is a culture. And companies are buying into it because they believe in process, and they're missing the whole idea of the culture that allows those processes and those frameworks to work. But really, really, really what Agile Manifesto is all about is delivering good software to a customer and giving you the environment to write that software. Where they really wanted to get to was not to have everybody stop at the Agile Manifesto. They wanted to get you to the Software Craftsmanship Manifesto. A lot of guys that did the Agile thing and they're right all the same guys that do this. Same guys. They wrote a bunch of books. Probably the first one Anybody ever read this? Seen this book? Pete McBreen. So this is like, I don't know if it's the first one, but it's, what do I got here? I got 507, okay. Um, this is like one of the most important, like I'll say groundbreaking works on software craftsmanship. This is the guy that put it on the map. Um, if you're wondering about this, I will, I will get this stuff up on SlideShare and we'll tweet it out or have it or something like this, uh, PDFs or whatever, you guys can pull all this stuff off. But really, it's pretty easy to find. You just Google this stuff, it's all on Amazon. So it's, it's really easy to find. And again, I found this stuff not by somebody telling me, go Google software craftsmanship. I found it because I would read a book and it would say, when you do it like this, you kinda wanna have this principle and that principle, and just like it says in this book over here. And then I'd go pull that book off the shelf and I'd be pulling through that. And again, like this is Barnes and Nobles, this is years ago. And I'd be going through these books and finding this stuff before you could actually full text search them and find it. And it would say, yeah, well, it's like Bob Martin says in The Clean Coder. And I'm over there reading that. And he's like, well, that's like so-and-so says in this book over here. And I'm back and forth. And I'm, this, is, this, is how it, this is how it happened to me. This is, this is how I got into this. So kind of like the web, you know, just like you never know where you're clicking. So, uh, I had the wrong name on there. Ignore that screen. The guy's name is Pete McBreen. I wrote Steve McBreen. No idea why. On the uh, subtitle. That's a mistake. Yeah, I, I, didn't run, I didn't run JS Hint on my slides. Um, next one I would say, I think I already mentioned this one. Clean Code. Handbook of Agile Software Craftsmanship by Robert C. Martin. Another one he wrote that's really famous is called The Clean Coder. Code of Conduct for Professional Programmers. Another one, I'm sure a lot of you have heard of this one. Pragmatic Programmer, have heard of that one before? Has anybody read it? These books are awesome. So again, this, the stuff I'm talking about all comes out of these books. I'm not gonna give you a book review on all these books. Um, have I read all these books? Uh, no. Have I read parts or mostly all of them? Some of them I've read a fourth, some I've read three fourths of them. Uh, some I've read all of them. But I have every single one of these books. And I'll say this too, is that, um, you know, life is great when you have a Kindle reader. So I, I'm a, I, I know guys are they're like, you know, I don't want to do that. I'll just go, you know, Google that thing. I'll find a PDF and I'll do it that way. Okay, fine. I, you know, I don't mind paying 25 bucks for a book that's going to change my life and help me write better software. At, most of us would get paid pretty decent, right? So why do we have this mentality of, I don't want people to pay me, but I don't want to pay anybody else? Why, why do we do that? Are you afraid of investing in your career? Are, are you not worth it, $25? If you bought 100 books for $25, 2,500 books, are you not worth $2,500 worth, worth of Kindle books? You know what I'm saying? I have at least that on my Kindle reader. And the great thing about it is it doesn't matter where I am. It's on my phone, it's on my iPad, it's on my Mac. I can go be on a contract at some corporate office. I got a Windows machine, I can put Kindle Reader on there. And in two minutes I have all my books. I don't have to have a hard copy at home and a hard copy at the office. I'm reading the book and I highlight something and the next time I open it up on my phone, the highlight's there. I'm sitting there at work trying to figure out a problem and I pop the thing open, I go, I can't remember what book was that in, click through, pop open all my highlights, boom, there it is, I've got what I needed right there at my fingertips. Pretty simple solution. Technology is great. Another book, this is actually probably the first book, 
that I was referred to, some of you were shaking your heads, you're a Microsoft guy, dude. Right? Yes? No? That guy. You are, yeah. So uh, Microsoft Press put this book out, but it is, is not specific to Microsoft. The principles, uh, this book, it, I, I've seen this referred to from a lot of other books. So this, this book here, um, and, and I have not read this cover to cover, but I've read about three-fourths of it twice and about half of it three or four times. So I keep reading the same things over and over because I realize I don't have it yet. This book here is the one that started my journey into software craftsmanship because something I was reading said, it's like Steve McConnell said in Code Complete. And I found the book on the shelf and I started reading and it just kind of went from there. This is the latest book I'm reading right now. I really like this one. The Software Craftsman, Professionalism, Pragmatism, and Pride. I was talking to Cody Rabbi this morning, we were talking, I was kind of running some of my ideas across from him, and I just loved his talk the other morning, um, and I could see that he's a, a really a craftsman at heart, and he just has a deep thinking process about what he does. And I was just bouncing ideas off of him because I respected his opinion, and, and, and I said, okay, so, you know, we talked through a few things, and I said, really, what does it all come down to you? And he thought about it a while, and he started to say something, and he stopped, and he started to say something, and he stopped, and he says, well... He said, you know, it really comes down to you really have to take pride in your work. This is our reputation. This is what we do. People see our code. And how we code, the quality of our code, how long our code endures, that, that matters. Not just how much you get paid or how many recruiters call you or what kind of project you're on next. It's the kind of job you do. So... Now let's talk about JavaScript. First thing I would say is that a lot of the stuff that we have, uh, I meant to be a little bit farther along by now, so I may, I may buzz through some of this. Um, but probably the biggest thing, you know, when we get to JavaScript, it, so we're running JavaScript on the server now, you've got the whole node thing, right? But most of the JavaScript in the world actually lives in a browser. And, and a lot of the, what, what you run into, a lot is that the, the ideas that we have in software engineering and the disciplines, you know, how we do things, how architects tell us to do it, and even whether, even whether you're agile, the, the architects are still telling you how to do things, and they're defining processes, and directors and executives, and this is the way it has to be, right? And a lot of these disciplines are good. You know, we have, we have code reviews, and, and we have different kinds of testing, and you know, we may have, hopefully, it'd be great when we have a separate QA department, you know, uh, we have QA at the dev level, and we have QA at the UA2. We have a whole separate people that do different levels of QA for different reasons, different kinds of data. In, in large applications, it goes like this. Uh, in smaller situations that are even much more agile, they don't typically have that many layers. But um, the, uh, the big thing here is I, I was trying to explain some stuff once to our director of architecture about why I wanted to do some things in the UI, and he just couldn't get it. He's like, well, that doesn't matter. And I think we were talking about, you know, ASI or something, automatic semicolon insertion, or one of those kind of things. And, and uh, I was trying to explain to him why this is important, and he didn't really believe it, because he goes out and he Googles it, and he finds some article that says, the rules of semicolon insertion are well-defined. It's really not that big of a risk, and all you guys are just making a big fluff out of nothing. Because the browser is made to insert those things whenever you leave them out. That's not the problem of inserting them where you leave them out. It's a matter of it inserting where you didn't want them to be. That's the problem. And what he didn't get was that he gets to run his code on a server cluster. 